So I have this thing where I can't not finish things. For example, if I start a book, I have to finish it. If that book has a sequel, I have to read that one too. Because otherwise it just lives in my head rent free for the rest of my life. I can list every single movie, franchise, TV show, book series I have left unfinished. And I just try so hard to not be this way because it is so illogical for me to waste my time on things I don't like. But unfortunately, it doesn't work. I read Son of the Slob so that I could have a peace of mind. And I am making this video for those of you who want the opposite experience. The book gets super duper stupid and disgusting and we're gonna discuss about all that. But before we do that, take a look at the warnings on the screen, Pookie. Because I only want to traumatize you if I have your consent, okay? This is a safe space. If you haven't read The Slob or watched my video on it, you're gonna be hella confused. So go do that real quick. Because Son of the Slob is set 8 years after the events that took place in the first book. We now have Vera who was tortured to no end and left with every possible reminder of it on her body and mind. We have Daniel, her shitty husband. And we have 7 year old Harold, Vera and unfortunately Slob's son. At the end of the Slob, she was pregnant, which is wild when you think about the fact that her womb was crushed and vacuumed. But nothing makes sense in Beauregard's book, so we just have to go with it. You might also be asking why she went ahead and gave birth to his baby though. She did give birth to him because Harold didn't do anything. He's just an innocent baby. Just because his father was a piece of shit doesn't mean he's gonna turn out just like him. I mean sure, if his father was just a piece of shit, I would understand. But Harold's dad was a cannibal. He was going all num num on women the entire time, boiling them down stuffing their grinded up meat into cans and he looks like that bitch from harry potter i don't know his name but this guy like would anyone give birth to that thing's offspring really we're supposed to just like accept that i mean the author could have just kept vera in that house with slob 10 more months and then she could have escaped that would have been believable but this this just screams cash grab for the last year or so, Vera has been going to this therapist who she despises because he will never truly understand how much she suffered and keeps on suffering. I mean, I get it, who can really grasp what happened to her? She's been let go from the hotel she used to work at as a maid because of her scars on her face left by a slob. The guests were less than pleased, the kids would cry on sight. It's really not her fault, they're just horrible people. She now has to work at a sketchy motel called The Lonely Bug. Spends her days cleaning up sheets with blood, piss, jizz, and shit, collecting syringes off the floors. Her home life isn't any better either. Her house turned into what she was afraid of the most, a stinking mess. She and Daniel stayed together, but Daniel hated her decision to keep Harold. For the first time, and the last time, I completely agree with Daniel, because Girl, come on, man. But the man is still useless. He has zero empathy skills. Remember how he was so annoyed that she couldn't be intimate with him? Because she has physical and mental trauma? Yeah, that man is trash. When it comes to Harold, little homie just stays in his room 90% of the time, and 10% he goes to this Christian school because that's the only place that would accept him because Harold looks just like a mini version of his dad. This vertically challenged bitch looks like he's 40, is morbidly obese, is balding but has enough hair on the rest of his body to make himself a fur coat, his teeth black and yellow, he needs to wear a diaper at all times, his diet consists of rats and cockroaches he kills with his bare hands and sometimes, sometimes his own poop. When I gazed into his buttery oversized eyeballs, I knew he loved me. Despite his retardation, I knew he understood and appreciated all I had done for him. He knew that I saved him. Harold had no means of conveying it, but in my heart, it was a sure thing. If it wasn't for me, he'd been the trash liner of an abortion clinic or shaking on the piss-stained floor of an asylum somewhere. And would that be so bad? Would it be so bad? Knowing all of this about our son, Vera, the crazy woman, hires a babysitter because she and Daniel are gonna go to therapy for a few hours. 
Harold has traumatized every babysitter so far, but the woman still hopes that it's gonna be different this time. Because obviously no one in their right mind would step foot in that hellhole, she takes Harold to the babysitter's house and runs away before the poor girl gets to take a look at this creature. The therapy is just all very simplistic, very regular stuff. The therapist is like, hey y'all, tell us something you remember from the first time you guys met. And Daniel repeats the god-awful joke that he made on their first date, remember that one? What did the cannibal do after he dumped his girlfriend? Uh-huh, he wiped his ass. Cause you know, he ate her. And then shitted her out. And catch this, no one looks at him weird. No one is like, Daniel, ayo, too far my guy. Too far, cause you know, your wife almost became that girlfriend that cannibal shitted out. Beauregard's attempt at dark humor is so suffocating because yeah, dude, we get it, man. We get the joke. We got it the first time. Ooh, foreshadowing. Ooh, so smart. Like, let it the f go already. But he doesn't. He never does. He doesn't even try to give these half-ass characters some kind of different history in this book. No, we hear about how Daniel was a perfect husband, would cook, would clean. He knocked her up during fatal attraction. Vera mentions that night they had sex and that gets Daniel triggered for some reason and he goes on this tangent about how it was all Vera's fault, how he told her to stop selling vacuums when she's pregnant, how it wasn't worth the money. He told her, he told her so, but she didn't stop and now their child, their real child, is forever gone and they became the kind of people who need a shrink. The guy who has PTSD from war and alcohol addiction says that, by the way. A little self-awareness. You needed therapy when you lost your legs in Vietnam and tried to drown your sorrows with guys named Jack, Jim, and Pam. 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 What the hell are you doing here, dude? You're ruining it. Again. He doesn't even stop there. He blames her for what the slob did to her as well. As if she could have known, as if she went through that torture willingly, as if she wanted her baby to die. Daniel says the slob warmed his way inside her and now he has to live with a creature that ruined his life. His life. His life. Oh shit man, sorry I didn't realize you were the one who got by a cannibal. Totally missed that part. My bad. My bad. Shut the fuck up. While Daniel is being a massive shitlord at the therapist's office, Harold is being a massive shitlord at the babysitter's house. Moments after she goes to the bathroom, Harold spots a vase on top of the mantle. He climbs his way to it, opens it up, and finds powdered cookies. Even though these are not the kind of cookies he's used to eating because the texture is all weird, he's not very picky about it, so he sticks his hand inside the vase and starts feasting. He can't really handle these powdered cookies though because he starts coughing and puffing and the powder gets absolutely everywhere. When the babysitter enters the room again, she loses it. And no, she's not overreacting. Because the thing is, that vase is not a vase. It's actually an urn. And the powdered cookies that are now everywhere, not cookies. They're her dead grandma's ashes. While I had hope, the facts were the facts. He'd already found a way to eat a dead woman before hitting puberty. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning is a school day. The Christian elementary school Harold goes to is run by priests and nuns, and they have a special needs class in the moldy basement. These kids not only have to exist in their room that probably contains many diseases, but they're also heavily abused. And what better name to give to their abuser nun than Sister Dumas? Okay, so a quick warning break. It's gonna get pretty ugly. If you can't handle hearing about kids being abused, skip to the next part. The timestamps are down below. Just keep your sanity intact, man. I'm not gonna get into too much detail about how the kids are feeling or how it actually happens, but I am going to you know, tell you what happens, if that makes sense, just go. You, you really don't have to hear this part. 
Sister Dumas asks a little girl named Shelly to start the day with a prayer, and as she's saying it, Dumas interrupts her yelling, telling Shelly that she doesn't deserve to talk about her God. Pure jealousy, like, I doubt Jesus would hit that stink stink, sister. But what's done is done. Shelly failed her test, so Dumas spills raw rice onto the floor, takes the bucket from the corner of the room that's been collecting shit water from the pipes, makes Shelly kneel and drink the water from it. And even worse, right after that, she starts to lesson with math. She writes 1 plus 3 on the board and looks at the classroom. There are three kids, one of them is drinking poop water, the other is stimming, bro is not even there, and the last one is Harold. She picks Harold to solve the problem and Harold can't solve it. So she makes Shelly to go grab Harold, unzip his pants, uh, places on top of the desk and Dumas grabs the chunky math book and slams it onto Harold's penis. Then enters Father Devonport. He tells his sister to send in whoever's in need for a confession to his confessional booth. The rest is thankfully not told to us, but we can all guess what he did to Shelley and Harold. The whole book is just a torture fest. If you haven't noticed, there's really nothing else to it. Beauregard tries everything in his inventory to make you feel disgusted. I know hearing it is hard for most of you i'm not having fun right now either for a variety of reasons honestly but if this part made you feel gross already i would advise you again to click off because it's about to get so much worse from here it just i mean i'm i'm trying everything for you to just leave when mara shows up to the lonely bug one of her biggest nightmares is waiting her She's supposed to clean a room that, according to her boss, looks like Jack the Ripper spent the night in, and he has just the thing to help her. Bizzle's self-contained 1632 model vacuum. OMG, it's all coming together. No the fuck ain't, girl. This is just here because why not? The, the vacuum is not mentioned again. It's, it's just here. Nothing leads to nothing in this book. Please don't get your hopes up again. While she's cleaning the bloody room, a young girl named Tina shows up and asks to check the room because the people that stayed last night owed her something. From her nervousness, Vera can tell she's in deep trouble. They get to talking. Tina's parents died in a car crash when she was about 10, and then she had to live with her uncle, and all he did was physically and sexually abuse her. So she ran away and found the people who stayed in that room last night, and they just pimped her out to everyone. The thing that they left to her in the room, she says, is crystal that she's going to sell to save herself from this life. When she's explaining that to Vera, a detective shows up at the door since it is a crime scene, and Tina exits out the window, leaving Vera to answer some very formally questions like, What's up? You know, have you ever seen anyone sketchy around here? Trying to enter this room, take something from it, you know? What's up? Tina meets her ex-boyfriend Greg. He is the one who found the people they're gonna sell the drugs to. They broke up because Greg is the kind of guy who would do anything for drugs, so he let some gay dudes hit it in the bag for money and caught HIV and didn't want to infect Tina. Tina the sex worker. Tina the sex worker who was pimped out like crazy in dirty motel rooms. Tina the sex worker who was pimped out like crazy in dirty motel rooms who still does not have HIV. Yeah, sounds about right. I was wondering when the routine homophobia was gonna kick in. They go to this gay dude's boat, but unfortunately he's not the only one there. A guy named Dutch Jones is also on the boat. He's the one who actually owns the crystal meth and the one who killed Tina's pimps because they tried to double cross him. Now he's furious because instead of bringing him what belongs to him, they tried to sell his shit, and we cannot have that. But he's still empathetic, he understands being young and dumb, so instead of killing Tina immediately, he tells his goonies to get a needle, extract some HIV and addiction-filled blood from Greg's eye, and inject it into Tina's. This way, she has time to figure out exactly where she did an oopsie. Awesome. And Greg gets his head crushed after that. The gay dude also gets killed because evil drug lord hates snitches and probably gay people. 
and then Tina runs away with her tiny pouch of goodies, courtesy of Dutch Jones. When Mary finishes the day and goes back to her home, she finds only Harold in his room but no Daniel, because Daniel made an attempt to bond with Harold, and Harold killed a rat in front of him, and he quite literally said, nope, and left to go to his old comrade's house. They will read about him, talk about his feelings. Again, because Daniel's an absent father, that means it's going to be a bring your free kid to work day for Vera and Harold. She leaves him in that Jack the Ripper room so that she can just go work without him bothering her. The runaway Tina also finds her way to the lonely bug and sneaks in through the bathroom window of one of the rooms, guess which room. Her plan is to end her life with Dutch Jones gave her, but luck is never on her side, so she accidentally falls and hits her head onto the toilet seat and cracks it. Harold hears the loud noise and goes to check it out, not only finds half-conscious Tina lying on the bathroom floor, but also the spilled crystals, and being the pig he is, he eats them all up. Now we have a high-as-fuck monster in our hands, and I guess his genes are wilding because he hallucinates his dad that he's never even seen before. And I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat this next part. I am getting so demonetized by y'all. I can't do this anymore. The slob guides his seven-year-old son, Harold, to split open Tina's torso and fuck her organs. Vera finds him in a bathtub with Tina's mutilated body that he's eating. Vera chooses to put her body into trash bags and take them to her house. Here's why she does that. I'm losing my fucking mind. First, what had happened in room 13 wasn't masterminded by Harold. It was the result of Tina breaking back into the room. And second, Harold didn't deserve to be punished as a result of her reckless actions. Bitch is eating her. He's eating her. If I called the police, Harold would be shipped away somewhere, locked inside an experimental facility to rot. Drop a bomb on him. In many ways, I was facing the same conundrum that my mother had. Would I choose my own life and happiness or help someone who was sick find their way? My mother could never live with the guilt of leaving her disturbed daughter Lisa to her own devices and neither could I. Your sister Lisa had bipolar and the most she did was a punch a hole in the wall. Your son Harold is using Tina's rib bone as a toothpick right now. My life was essentially just Harold. What was I going to do? Without him, I would just clean rooms and walk around with my ghastly face frightening those I came into contact with, reliving my nightmares while I slept and praying to stray from them when I woke. Take up a hobby. Go off the grid. Learn how to surf. You have options. The next morning, Harold goes to school like he didn't just eat someone. And of course, things have to go even weirder because we're getting close to the end. Hallelujah. Sister Dumas is helping Harold with his extra curriculum, meaning she has an extra long rosary inside her ass right now, and Harold has to pull it out of her. Reach for the Lord, Harold, she says. Pull him toward you. Let him take hold of you. Take the crucifix. Harold ends up using the poopy rosary to strangle Dumas, and honestly, Good riddance. Vera thinks the same too when she finds her and her drawer full of disturbing Polaroids of children. Dumas ends up in trash bags in Harold's room right next to Tina. Is it enough, you think? Of course not. Here comes Daniel. The only reason why Daniel comes back is because he sees a dream. He's in Vietnam and he kills a pregnant woman and the baby rips open his mom's belly and it's Harold. Daniel really did kill an innocent woman who was pregnant and he feels guilty about it. He thinks that since he took a baby's life away with no care, he should care for a baby who has no life or some shit like that. I don't know, Borga tried to be poetic, but I forgot. Anyway, he's back, but Harold has a taste for blood now, so he suffocates Daniel with a trash bag because everybody ends up in trash bags. Mommy likes people in trash bags. Mommy likes Daniel. Daniel should be in a trash bag. <laughs> A really crucial detail is that he was also shitting himself while doing it. So the only thing Daniel smelled when he was dying was Harold's poop. Just wanted to add that in. 
Vera comes back to find her husband dead in his wheelchair with Harold just doing Harold things. She decides she can't take it anymore. She realizes there's no part of her inside Harold if he can kill the one she loves the most with no regard to her well-being. So she rushes at him with a knife, but before she can finish him, detectives who've been on her ass this whole time kick open the door and shoot her. Detectives think the Polaroids Vera took from Dumas's drawer as evidence were actually hers, that she killed Harold. She killed Sister Dumas, Tina, and Daniel and put them in trash bags and brought them here. So Harold, now an orphan, grows up at an orphanage and 11 years later he goes back to a school. He kills Father Davenport in the confessional booth that he used to assault kids in. The next sermon, every churchgoer, including the altar boys who have been abused by him, find his severed head on the podium. His mouth wide open, but his tongue missing, as if he wants to lie more to people, but is unable. Uh, okay. So, my thoughts, my thoughts, my thoughts. I'm gonna keep this short, if I can. Before I forget this, I don't remember if this was a thing in the first book, but characters use the N-word in this one, specifically Dutch Jones. And there's also another slur that I forgot, but I'll add it onto the screen. I don't know if Dutch Jones is black or not. His race is not mentioned. And I'm not gonna like moan about the usage of N-word in works of white authors because my skin complexion is the same as Oreo filling. I'm only telling you this because it happens and I want to let you know. After having read three books of Aaron Beauregard, what I understood completely is that not only is he unable to write female characters, but he also just doesn't want to empathize with them either. At that point, just don't write women. I swear it's better if you only write men, fill your books to the brim with testosterone, no one would complain. You can very clearly see in his writing that he understands men's struggles even when they do shitty, horrible, criminal, downright psychopathic, cannibalistic things. He doesn't shy away from giving them their own set of boundaries and morals. I'm not gonna say Daniel's a self-insert, but it definitely feels like he stores a special liking to him. He's very biased when he's writing Daniel, gives him time and attention and never once tries to judge or criticize him, not through the dialogue or inner monologue. He doesn't make Daniel question himself and his own mistakes without a selfishness overriding every other emotion. But when it comes to Vera, she always questions. She's always selfless. She always thinks it's her fault when things go wrong. She still thinks Daniel is a perfect husband, even after he beats up Harold, even after he goes back to his alcoholic habits, even after he doesn't try to help her recover her self-image or sense of worth after suffering through something so unspeakable even after he blames her for killing their son, even after he blames her for ruining his life. She never even tells him once that he could have left, that he didn't have to stay if he was not going to help her deal with the aftermath. Beauregard allows Daniel to not take any responsibility for their unfortunate circumstances, but doesn't allow Vera to do the same. Nothing Daniel does is wrong. Everything Vera does is. Daniel is a martyr who dies because of Vera. This is absolutely true for Tina as well, because even though Greg is the one who found the gay dude who snitched on them, Tina is the one blaming herself, and Greg is the martyr. Such a good guy. Didn't even keep his HIV a secret, but because Tina needed money and was being a stupid bitch, he died. Borgard always finds a way to make women's pain be women's fault. He always finds a way to make women sound devoid of reason. Even with Vera, who is the only character written in first person, so you would expect to know everything that's going through her mind, and at least for some parts of it, to make fucking sense. But no. No, because she's just a puppet in a sick play. Her actions are based on emotions and vibes, while Daniel's actions are based on logic. She doesn't know why she kept Harold, but Daniel knows exactly why he returned back to the house. The women in Borgard's stories act on their impulse, the men in Borgard's stories act on their plan. That is very stereotypical misogyny, you'd have to try your hardest not to see that. Women never even get their revenge at the end either, Vera killed the slob just to deal with Harold and get killed after all that suffering. Tina had not a single moment of breather throughout her entire storyline, but Harold, 
did get his revenge, and so did Rock in Playground. I'm not saying it's a bad thing they did, I'm just saying that I'm seeing a pattern. Like, anyone remember Shelly? What the fuck happened to her? I'm seeing a lot of different patterns actually and they all lead to my exhaustion. I feel like you can sense it too because I didn't even try with this video, did I? I just wanted to let it all out and be done with this slaw business. I didn't even try to jokey joke in this video. Like, can you imagine? I didn't even want to yap. I was so straightforward with it. That is so unlike me if you've been watching for a while. Anyway, man, I'm done. You know, consider my soul sucked dry, bro. Peace out. Whatever. I'm gonna have a brownie while watching YouTube. I need my iPad kit moment to cure me right now. I wish you all happiness because I'm not. I still have to edit this. I don't even have memes.